And this is February the 2nd, is that right? February 2nd, 2022, Tiny Temple recording in Ulasnaga with Venerable Kantikema. And this is about uh, the wealth, seven types of wealth to be developed in this lifetime, in this existence. Okay, here we go. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the holy one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, so look at the poem first. And it's kind of nice because, um, because the way it is set up looks to me like a stitchery, looks to me like somebody could lay it out and do a stitchery of it. And it's, it's very to the point. And um, Sarab's right when you're saying that there wasn't, they weren't measuring things by money and they weren't using coffee beans, you know, like in South America for the wealth. Uh, but in Buddhist terms, there was a system of wealth and it was by how much these things could be fulfilled, these types of wealth. And these were the measured wealths that the Buddha taught about. And so the, the, uh, the way this is laid out on the paper is a good way to kind of frame it and put it up. It's kind of kind of nice. All right. There are these seven kinds of wealth to gain in this world. Which seven? The wealth of faith, the wealth of virtue, the wealth of conscience, the wealth of concern, the wealth of learning, the wealth of generosity, and the wealth of wisdom. These are the seven kinds of wealth in this existence. The wealth of faith, the wealth of virtue, the wealth of conscience and concern, learning, generosity, and wisdom are the seven wealths. And one who has these wealths, whether a woman or a man, they are poor or not poor, I say their life is not diluted. So whether they are poor or not poor has nothing to do with it. Therefore, it is faith and virtue, confidence and insight into the Dhamma, the intelligent should be devoted to. These are the very essence of the Buddha in, found in the Samyutta Nikaya. So I'm going to jump out of here for a minute because I'm not sure I have this on the right way. Did I turn it on the right way for you? Oh, that's good. I, I kissed it goodbye. <laughs> this is good. Display, display the notes. Oh. Uh, do you want me to put that up again? Just yes, a display, display, please display. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I come back to you and go here, and it's right here for you. There you go. Now you see it, okay? So what they're basically, let's let's go into the suttas and see if we can come to understand this a little bit better. So we'll do the um, first one. And this one is found on page 182 and 183 of the Samyutta Nikaya Bodhi's translation. It's in the Kasala Samyutta. Book number three. It's the, the title of it is Childless. At Sawati, 
Then King Pasanadi of Kasala approached the Blessed One and he paid homage to him. I'm going to come out here and we can go back to that later on. Okay. He sat down on one side. The Blessed One then said to him, where are you coming from, great king, in the middle of the day? Here, venerable sir, a financier householder in Sawati has died. I have come after conveying his heirless fortune to the palace as he died intestate. Now this basically what it means is there was no will. And so the palace or the kingdom took over the wealth and that's how he died. And so the representative of the king went and there were no heirs that were declared. So they took the fortune for the palace. There were 80 lakhs of gold, not to speak of silver. And yet, venerable sir, that financier householder's meals were like this. He ate red rice along with sour gruel. His clothes were like this. He wore a three-piece hempen garment. His vehicle was like this. He went about in a dilapidated little cart with a leaf awning on top. So it is, great king. So it is, great king. When an inferior man gains abundant wealth, he does not make himself happy and pleased, nor does he make his mother and father happy and pleased, nor his wife and children nor his slaves, workers, and servants, nor his friends and colleagues, nor does he establish an offering for ascetics and Brahmins, one leading upwards of heavenly fruit, resulting in happiness conducive to heaven. Because his wealth is not being used properly, kings will take it away, or thieves will take it away, or fire will burn it, or water will carry it away, or unloved heirs, they will take it. Such being the case, great king, that wealth not being used properly will go to waste and not to proper utilization. Now suppose, great king, in a place uninhabited by human beings, there was a lotus pond with clear, cool, sweet, clean water and good fords, delightful, but no people would take that water or drink it or bathe in it or use it for any purpose. And in such a case, great king, that water not being used properly would go to waste, not to utilization. So too, great king, when an inferior man gains abundant wealth, that wealth not being used properly will go to waste and not to proper utilization. But great king, when a superior man gains abundant wealth, he makes himself happy and pleased. And he makes his mother and father happy and pleased and his wife and children and his slaves and workers and servants, his friends and his colleagues. And he establishes an offering for ascetics and Brahmins, one leading upwards of heavenly fruit, resulting in happiness and conducive to heaven. Because his wealth is being used properly, kings do not take it away. Thieves do not take it away. Fire does not burn it. Water does not carry it away. And unloved heirs do not take it away. And such being the case, great king, that wealth being used properly goes to utilization and not to waste. Now, suppose great king, not far from a village or a town, there was another lotus pond with clear, cool, sweet, clean water and drink. Sweet, 
good fords, delightful, and people would take the water and drink it and bathe in it and use it for their purposes. And in such a case, great king, the water being used properly, appreciated, would go to utilization and not to waste. And so too, great king, when a superior man gains abundant wealth, that wealth being used uh -huh. properly, goes to utilization and not to waste. As cool water in a desolate place evaporate without being drunk, so when a scoundrel acquires wealth, he neither enjoys himself nor does he give it to others. But when the wise man obtains wealth, he enjoys himself and he does his duty, having supported his kin and free from any blame, that noble man goes to a heavenly state. So this is the first story. And, you know, one time I visited um, in Nevada, I went to, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it. Somebody has to tell me. <laughs> It's where they have all the gambling and everything. You know, uh, what's it called? You know what I'm talking about? In Nevada, in the United States. Casino? Yeah, the casinos and everything. And what happened was that Bonte Vimala Ramsey and I, we were driving across the country and we stayed at one of the Thai temples. And we had to stay one, only one night. So I stayed in a, a woman's house that provided a place for nuns. Bonte stayed in the temple overnight. When we came back the next morning to meet for breakfast time, it was interesting because they had had a celebration that was happening when we first arrived, and they had quite a big collection of money in the temple by the end of the night. And while Bonte was sleeping, a man came into the temple and stole the box with the money in it. The next morning, of course, the abbot we thought would be very upset. Ponte said, the abbot is not even upset. I said, why is he not upset? The abbot only smiled at Bonte and he said, let me explain, this man has stolen this money, but by tonight, he won't have any of that money left at all. It'll disappear just like that because it was gotten in an you know, unlawful way and he broke the precepts to do this and it caused harm and it caused shame and it caused a lot of bad things for him. And he would have taken it and probably gambled it all away in one night. It was close to three or $4,000 that was in that box. And that's just the way the abbot said, uh, you know, don't even worry about it. It'll all come back to the temple, it's all right. But you see, this is the problem. If we're breaking the precepts, it makes it not only so we can't practice our meditation, but it makes us so we can't rest with a low blood pressure in our life and a nice resting pulse either, because things are going to bother us again and again. And it isn't money that you can hold on to if you're thieving. It doesn't work out. <laughs> it's much better to keep the precepts. And the precepts are meant not as commandments, but as the Buddha's own experience with advice in this whole matter of, um, of basically, uh, you know, understanding and teaching how he had practiced the, 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 without the precepts or practiced with the precepts that we read about in Sutta number 19. So in the first part of that Sutta, he makes it clear before he was enlightened, when he was still a bodhisattva, he saw that everything was a mess in the world and he decided to see how the best way to live was. Was it better for him to live with the precepts or to live without the precepts? And he tested it both ways and came up with an answer that definitely it was the right way for him to uh, do it by keeping the precepts. Okay, let me see. I'm trying to see if somebody is... Okay. Okay, okay. Hello. Okay, the next one we're going to go into 
The next one is on page 314 and 315. Um, this one, and 316, it's a little tiny story. It's called Alavaka, and it's number 12, and it's in the Yaka Samyutta, book number 10, and it's on the same subject. Well, I just read through this because it isn't really very long, so let's go through this and take a look at what's said. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Alava, Alavi, the haunt of the Yaka Alavaka. Then the Yaka Alavaka approached the Blessed One and he said to him, get out, ascetic, leave now. All right, friend, the Blessed One said, and he went out. Come in, ascetic, come in now. All right, friend, the Blessed One said, and he went in. And a second time, the same thing happened. And a third time, the Yaka Alavaka said to the Blessed One, get out, ascetic. All right, friend, the Blessed One said, he went out. Come in, ascetic. All right, friend, the Blessed One said, and he went in. The fourth time, the Yaka Alavaka said to the Blessed One, get out, ascetic. I won't go out, friend. Do whatever you have to do. I'll ask you a question, ascetic, he said. If you won't answer me, I'll drive you insane and I'll split your heart and I'll grab you by the feet and hurl you across the Ganges River. I do not see anyone in this world, friend, with its devas, Mara and Brahma. In this generation with its ascetics and Brahmins, it's devas and humans who could drive me insane or split my heart and grab me by the feet and hurl me across the Ganges. But ask whatever you want, friend. The Alavaka said, what here is a man's best treasure? What practiced well brings happiness? What is really the sweetest of tastes? How lives the one who they say lives the best? And then the Blessed One replied, faith is here, a man's best treasure. Dhamma practiced well brings happiness. Truth is really the sweetest of tastes. One living by wisdom, they say, he lives the best. Alavaka, how does one cross over the flood? How does one cross the rugged sea? How does one overcome suffering? How is one purified? The Blessed One replied, by faith, one crosses over the flood. By diligence, the rugged sea. By energy, one overcomes suffering. By wisdom, one is purified. Alavaka, how does one gain wisdom? How does one find wealth? How does one achieve a claim? How bind friends to oneself? When passing from the world to the next, how does one not sorrow? And the Blessed One replied, placing faith in the Dhamma of the Arahants for the attainment of Nibbana. From desire to learn one gains wisdom if one is diligent and astute. Doing what is proper and dutiful, one with initiative finds wealth by truthfulness one wins a claim. Giving, one binds friends. That is how one does not sorrow when passing from this world to the next. The seeker of the household life 
in whom dwell these four qualities, truth, dhamma, steadfastness, generosity, does not sorrow when he passes on. Come now, ask others as well, the many ascetics and Brahmins, where there is found here anything better than truth, self-control, generosity, and patience. The Alavaka said, why now should I ask this question of the many ascetics and Brahmins? Today I have understood the good pertaining to the future life. Indeed, for my sake, the Buddha came to reside at Alavi. Today, I have understood where a gift bears great fruit. I myself will travel about from village to village, town to town, paying homage to the enlightened one and to the excellence of the Dhamma. So this one echoes everything that we were finding in the other uh, screen when we put this up before and we peeked at it, this one. And we said, this is encompassing seven kinds of wealth reflected similar in a similar way here. In the beginning of this conversation, we said, in the time of the Buddha, it was not so much the gold or, or silver or gemstones that one held as what one shared and when, how much one helped that measured the wealth of the people that were talked of as the richest in the land. Here today, we've sort of flipped that over, haven't we? <laughs> It seems that we've really turned it around within most countries and turned it into a huge race for simply the money and wealth and without a lot of the understanding that needed to be learned for balance of mind and of body and of life. So go through these again. There were these seven kinds of wealth to gain in this world, in this existence. Which seven? The wealth of faith. I cannot tell you how difficult my life was when I was young, but I don't want to go there in the whole big long story. But I can tell you there were a number of times that if I had no faith at all that something would come to an end and change, I would not be here now. There were too many difficult times that I know about in times of the Vietnam War, for instance, in the military and the guys in the service and everything would tell you so many stories of how important it was to have faith, faith that something would change, faith that something would come to an end, faith that something would, would turn around. And they're speaking mostly of Anicca in these times when they're talking like this. But faith can, that everything is not going to stand still and just be the way it is when it's not going well, is one of the strongest things that we can develop in our life. And virtue speaks for itself. And it's been quite a mess we caused in the 60s, quite a terrible mess in the West. And it still isn't cleaned up and balanced. It still isn't, isn't quite balanced pretty universally. But virtue speaks for itself and escaping what some countries might feel as a, a latch on virtue and why do I have to be in the system? I don't know if I would say sometimes the system is not right, sometimes it is good and it turns out wonderful when you're talking about preset marriages and things like that. Sometimes it can turn out just terrible. But the, but the thing about it is, is virtue is something that once you break virtue and you cannot take it back, it can be so devastating later on if someone doesn't tell you how to forgive yourself and let the past go and get in the present time and move forward. And that's what people have to learn in this day and time. It has to be that way. 
regardless, we go country to country, and I've been in a lot of places in the world, and you go country to country to country, and you look at virtue, 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 and you see this all different ways. The extremes don't seem to be bendable, and the looseness doesn't pay off. So I don't know what else I can really say about that. You should jump in and say something too from your angle as we go and talk about this. Then the next one is conscience. And conscience is really important. Conscience is one thing and concern, the wealth of concern. Developing the wealth of conscience is to, okay, my favorite story about this was sitting and talking with a group of friends about politics. And we knew that none of us sitting there talking about politics was actually going to leave our jobs and go get involved in politics. But it was important that we say what party we're in when we're going to vote and things like that. And my remedy was the same as my father's and my grandfather's and my great grandfather's was basically independent remain independent, examine what needs to happen, decide who you're gonna vote for and voting is important to vote. But, <laughs> you know, this can be a real stickler because then we had a long conversation once and someone showed up and said, we said, well, what party are you in? I have no party, I have no politics. And the statement, I have no party, I have no politics instead of an independent, is or a, I forget what they call it when you're in the in the middle, but um, uncommitted or something. But independent is legitimately counted in most countries as a position in politics. But but when you say I I do not have any political position, then just remember you have no right to complain about anything that happens in the country at all, and your conscience is going to hurt as a result of it it'll catch up with you because you the conscience and concern we take for our communities. And this has to do with citizenship. It has to do with uh, national uh, pride of a country, you know, as being a citizen. It should be that we're allowed to do that. I can, I can simply say the global community is a great idea, but do you honestly want everybody to wear blue and yellow ties and white shirts and black shoes for the rest of the universal time? And there will be no names of countries anymore. And we should abandon language and have one tongue and all the rest of it. I mean, it's, it's like, that's an absolutely crazy thing. You know, in India has a lot of different, a lot of different languages, doesn't it, Sarma? You know, India has a lot of different languages that exist in, in uh, in India. So there's always been an, if in, you know, a, a little bit of a problem going from country to from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom like this and going around. There's a whole history of that here. So this gets really interesting, but conscience is one thing and concern and then doing something. Now, what do you have to do? It doesn't mean you have to run for office. It doesn't mean you have to go down there and get in the legislature. Honestly, it just means you need to sit down once a week and write letters together as a community about what you actually think. Because the one thing that works universally in all countries that have any kinds of elections is the constituency that are going to elect the people into office. It's very interesting. So in our country, in my country, in the United States, if you're in, let's see if I can remember this, in Delaware, if you and I write a letter, it only accounts for 300 letters. But if we were in Virginia, it counts for 4,000. And if we're in California, it counts for some ridiculous thing like 11,000 votes. So when that person who's in office gets your letter of opinion and what you think is, it's important to tell them what you think is wrong, but it's also important for you to tell them exactly how you think you should change it and how you can make it right. And when people start seeing that and they start doing it, writing letters can be a very forceful thing and a way for you to say it was my conscience and it was my concern and this is what I did and it's an honest effort because that politician is sitting in his office and somebody's hired in his office to count those letters every week and tell him what the constituency is actually going to do when they vote next time. So I know there's more to the game than me making it that simple but actually 
that's the most effective way for a family to get across to the children, for instance, that we don't just sit there and do nothing. We have a conscience, we see what's going on, and this is the wealth of conscience developing it in a way where you don't upset your business or upset your job or your school or anything else, but your family takes a position and lets it be known through letter writing. And it's a safe way, it's a safe way of doing this. So this is conscience and concern. And then the next one is wealth of learning. And wealth of learning is probably the best example we have of this that I know of is Baba Sahib. Uh, and, and really Dr. Amakar emphasized education so tremendously for the protection of the people once somebody says, Okay, you're all free. Now you can dream and be whatever you want to be. But it's up to you. It's up to you to actually go and learn what you need to learn, decide what you want to be, pursue what you want to be, and not stop because on paper, it's there protecting you, but you have to activate it. So this continual learning, it's, it's a wonderful thing and it's a wonderful idea. My only advice is I have met people that have gone slightly overboard and forgotten to get married, have kids, have a family and other things, you know, and that's all they decide to do. It could be a great thing, but it could be a downfall for family life also. So we have to look for balance. And one of the things the Buddha was stressing through all of the Dhamma consistently was balance, balance of everything and coming back to nature. Okay, so this is just the way I look at learning. I, anybody is welcome to put their opinion up about this. And then generosity is the next one. And it puts this into perspective because learning generosity and wisdom down below where it is, is showing up in uh, bold, these are the seven kinds of wealth in this existence. But then it tells you the wealth of faith, the wealth of virtue stands alone, the wealth of conscience and concern sit together and learning, generosity and wisdom are the completion of the seven wealths. So one has these wealths to develop and um, I just need to fix this. So before you ask me for it, wait a minute. I forgot about that word. Okay. Um, whether they are poor or not poor, having the development of this in their life and never have to really fear about uh, falling down. There always is a way if you get up and start again, you get up and start again, get up and start again. Somebody said to me once, uh, did I know I would become a nun? I said, no, but I always wondered what was going on when I was growing up because I had so many jobs over the years. And it just happened that I had the opportunity to have so many incredibly neat jobs. And I was a fast learner and uh, very active in whatever I was doing and developing and very successful at it. And then I would have to move because I was married uh, the first time to someone, I moved 19 times in 10 years. You can figure that one out, <laughs> okay? That was the military wife's uh, legacy. To move that many times and live so many different places as your children were being born and growing up. Yeah, it, it, but at the same time, it was interesting. I mean, I got to work at orphanages, teach England uh, English to the Chinese in Taiwan. I got to uh, work for veterinarians. I worked as a staffing coordinator in a hospital long enough to really know what that job was about and um, worked in politics and worked in human rights and worked in the peace movement in ways where I was going back and forth from Washington to Virginia to Pennsylvania and different states on the East Coast. And, um, you know, gave lectures about uh, stress in children living in the nuclear age of all things, because my children were touched by the nuclear arms race. And there were families who got together and started an organization to teach people how they could alleviate the stress in children while the adults were having a race to you know, build so many missiles. And as one person said when I was giving a lecture once on the Eastern seaboard in a private school, uh, one woman who was a cook in the kitchen of the school came out with a cart 
and she had um, piled up the cookies in uh, according to the way we had given the talk. And she said, you know, the whole interesting thing about this. And I said, what is that? And she said, uh, there's something very wrong here because they're taking all this money to build these weapons, but the, they keep developing them and they know perfectly well that they can't use them, they can't eat them, and they can't ride them. <laughs> and this was talking about these big missiles flying over to shoot countries. And to her, it was very a silly thing to be involved in because it was very basic for her. She came from a poor community and she saw it very simply as why would anybody spend all that money to build something that you can't ride it, you can't eat it, and you cannot use it? Because if you use it, you won't be able to grow food afterwards, you won't be able to live there afterwards, and so forth. So some of the you know, simplest people can see so clearly what is actually um, what is actually wrong. And um, and what is wrong, and um, and can actually tell you how to how to fix it in simple simple ways. Just one second. Hi, I'm in class. Do you need to help? You need, are you in class? Coming? Oh, you're not able to log in. Well, I I can't, okay. Wait a minute. I missed, missed some people. Hold on a second. I, I probably have to go out there and I have to um, let people in again. I'm not sure how to do this. Some people are in. How many people are not able to get in? Login number might, might be changed. How, um, it's seven, it's. Okay, um, well, I, will speak. I will spell out. Do you know how to do it, Sarma? Seven one six seven one six three zero three four three seven double nine. Yeah, seven one six three zero three four three seven double nine. Yeah, wait a second. I can't hear him. I don't know what happened. Bonte, you're muffled. I can't hear you. Wait a minute. Okay. How do you do that? You take on uh, the, uh, the list, and then there is an option, uh, waiting room. Then you just click on that waiting room, it will disable the waiting room. I'm hunting for it and uh, enable waiting room. And now I have disabled the waiting room. Okay. <laughs> this is all recorded. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so we we do have other guests who are trying to get in and can't get in. So just remember, I want you all to give me credit because I did push the recording button button this time. <laughs> okay, so Sarma, where were we? Which one were we on? Um I was here. And I was giving you this, right? Okay. So the biggest wealth is generosity. And I think universally, I'm not sure how some religions look at this, but I know in Christianity, it was more blessed to give than to receive. And But what seemed to me like was when you pay a tithe in the church, things always came back to you and every you did extremely well. If you didn't pay your tithe, things might not go so well in the church. And nobody could explain to me when I was growing up how that worked. But in, in comically speaking, in Buddhism, it's really simple. What goes around comes around. And what you put out, you get back. And what, uh, whatever you, uh, the energy that you put out comes back to you threefold. This works on the negative side of things as well as the positive side. And it's kind of interesting to keep that in mind. 
you don't want to sort of you don't want to put a hex on somebody because it'll come back three to five times on you later on. So this, but it's basically doing the same thing, and it's a universal discussion of karma when you're talking about generosity. And then wisdom is something that you're working to develop in Buddhism, but we've talked about this many times because there actually is a, a recipe for this. And in the Buddhist system, one has to, there's, there's learning, it, okay, first of all, there's a training that he's teaching us and the teaching is entirely based on what the Buddha actually experienced himself when he did his own investigation and then he went through. So what he decides to teach upon becoming awake is he decides to show you how to do that specifically in a way where it will come back around for you and you'll be able to go through also and experience Nibbana in the different levels of attainment. So this is, this is the one piece of what of, of this. And then the next part is when you are investigating, he emphasizes throughout the text again and again and again, two things. One is knowledge and vision. He even gives you stories where he's asked a monk to leave and not stay in the meditation school if they're not willing to ask questions and practice knowledge and vision, which is the way that he teaches. Now, this, this knowledge and vision was very counter to what was happening with the other teachers at the time, which then turns the Buddha into somewhat of an activist, you know, because he's willing to introduce what finally helped him to go through and see everything totally clearly in the present time and for him in the present moment was discovered by first seeing it actually operate as you're watching mind. The Buddha does a lot of things that are very different on his journey for you to get to knowledge and wisdom, but he wants you to use knowledge and vision, knowing something and accepting it only by seeing it for yourself. Therefore, it puts us in a position if we're following the texts very carefully. We're not teaching you. We're guiding you. We're only trying to guide you to stay on track for 10 days, and if you follow the instructions only the instructions without mixing anything else with it, we now know that it truly does work. I mean, when I did a retreat for 16 people and 14 of them actually went all the way through, that convinced me I knew exactly that we were doing it the right way. But the thing was that uh, what makes a person go fast or go slow or progress or not be progressive they, can't, they don't follow the instructions. They mix it up with other things. And this, this is uh, the recipe for reaching the wisdom the Buddha is talking about comes back to the practice. And the practice was a very delicate kind of recipe. I would equate it to, I can teach you how to cook, for instance, but teaching you how to be a pastry chef is more difficult than any kind of cooking I would teach you to do or any kind of cuisine, French, English, German, Spanish, anything. It would be more difficult for me to teach you how to do pastry than anything else. You have to you know, follow precisely what they're telling you in the recipes and not touch it or poke it one little tiny bit or, or the dough doesn't work. You know, And this is kind of what I keep seeing happen when the student is told it's a gradual teaching with a gradual practice, with a gradual progress, what makes the progress go faster or slower is whether you follow the instructions carefully and precisely or not. And it's like 10 days to try this. It's nothing. 10 days to try it. In five days, in, we figure in five days now, after thousands of people doing this, we know it's like four or five days and you see what we're doing that's different. And once you touch that, you want to do it precisely. You're very careful about attempting to do it precisely and see exactly what this is and go for it. And it's really fun to watch people open up and just come wide-eyed to you and say, 
do you know what I just discovered when you had just told them that about 100 times? <laughs> and, then, and it still is a, a wonderful thing to see somebody come and go, oh, I just I just really saw an each other perfectly, you know, or I, I understand the dukkha precisely. Oh, wow. And it happens the same way every time. And craving is so fine pointed in this teaching that when we give you the definition, all you have to do is start paying attention, close attention to the tension level in, in your body. Uh, and if there's this level starting to get tighter at any point, if you use right effort and you simply recognize this is starting to happen and what's starting to happen, your personal opinion, your personal desire, that's the craving coming up and starting to grab you. So it's all very, very systematic. The when I taught at the convent in, um, in uh, Pune, it was a fascinating experience because the director came to me and said, I had no idea this could be so systematic. And she was taking very careful notes. And the students in that course were taking very careful notes. And of course, the gift for me after four years of struggling in India was they're all English speakers fluently working in position, professional positions of work. They're all 28 to 30 year old women, 28 to 38 years old, and they were all training to become ordained as Catholic nuns in the Vatican at uh, the end of this year after being together and working for like six years along with their jobs training for this. So seeing, seeing them succeed so easily because they were so good at taking precisely what I'm saying and writing it down and nothing in excess and doing precisely what they were told. And um, it was amazing. It is an amazing thing. And I'm not sure what was more fun, them succeeding so incredibly well or me feeling like, oh, finally I can see see that I am doing this the right way and it can be followed precisely and no problems you see and we have now got several uh, several translators that are our students and know the practice uh, we still have people who will contact me and say please come please do a three-day no I won't do it anymore because it isn't worth it to do a three-day because you can't touch what we're doing you can't taste it so it has to be four, about four days is probably the shortest period of time to taste it. But to get people to do the 10 day is just a really important uh, jump to have them try it. So let's go back to this for a minute. You have the faith, virtue, conscience, concern, learning, uh, generosity, and wisdom. And the learning generosity, the generosity for yourself. Now this is... Listen, we're going back when we talk about this generosity and say the wealth of generosity starts out with Dana Sila Bhavana, not Sila Samadhi Panya, Dana Sila Bhavana, okay? Why? Because that's how it was originally taught when you go back into the in suttas and you look precisely, that's how it began. Then from there, the Sila Samadhi Panya and the Sila includes the generosity, the dana, and the sila in one piece for the second, second three. And sila samadhi, the samadhi, we say, is tranquil wisdom insight meditation. So if a person is doing vipassana, what should they do? They've been doing vipassana for a long time. That's fine. And they have developed a sensitivity to the body very strongly a sensitivity to the body to feel any change of sensation in the body or in in the mind so once you tell them the reality of a definite a, a workable a workable definition of craving once you do that then they are the ones who will pick up it's time to do the steps for the right effort right now They'll pick up the moment they feel that tightness change and or they're feeling pulled away from what they're doing. That's the moment that that tension changes and they're the ones that are going to pick it up first. So I did a chart study on this for five or six retreats. 
and I'll be darned if it wasn't true. It was true. Those people who did Vipassana for a number of years who were good enough to put that aside and try this as a pure test of what it is, had this ability to sense the change in the tension and tightness very early. And they let go and they kept smiling, uh, which is very foreign, which is very unique. And it's in the text all over the place and left out for many hundreds of years. But when a person is happy, if you're going to say the Dhammapada is true and you say that we are the happy ones, how does a human being show you that they're happy? Like this mm -hmm. or like this? You don't have to open your mouth. You smile. And when you smile, how does your mind feel? And this is the whole thing. And when it's light and it's open, something else is happening in the brain. And what it is, is the sharpness, the clarity, acuteness, an acute type of awareness for watching what's happening inside. And you start watching very clearly inside precisely what's happening. And your reports are so simple. We see you every day. In the normal retreats, there are only 25 people in the retreats. Now they're going to challenge me this year. They're going to give me 70 and 100 and things like that. So we'll see how that works out. <laughs> but the, the seeing, we have to do it in groups and take the person who has the weakest one out of the five sitting in front of you and ask them the five questions and see what happens. And the questions are very precise, but the charts don't lie. I have 13 years of charts sitting in the closet and they're so specific, like the director was saying at the convent, specific what the Buddha was doing, very precise. You know, so the uh, this wonderful experience of the, um, the, um, the generosity opening the heart and then when your heart is open more and softened, and then you're working with the Brahma Viharas and you're sending to yourself just briefly, you're not, send, you're not sending loving kindness to yourself as a practice. I wanna point this out. You're only sending loving kindness to yourself first to fill up your tank so that you have more to give to other people. Because today we have to be honest about the psychological position of mankind. <laughs> and most people really don't like themselves right now. This is this, unfortunately, there is this, this many, and this many are okay, but this many down here, the, the weight is over here of a lot of people don't like themselves right now. And they have to want to uh, lift themselves up before they can smile and lift someone else up. It's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. Once you start doing that, you find out that you feel so much better from giving something to someone. And this was definitely purification system and a retraining system for the mind, the two pieces. That's what tranquil wisdom insight meditation actually is. So um, we said that we we're using uh, knowledge and vision, and that is the same thing as direct knowledge. These two are just exactly the same thing. Direct knowledge, I'm seeing it. Knowledge and vision, knowing something by seeing it. So it's the same thing. And once you're practicing that way, that's you've set up the cornerstone, the foundation stone for knowledge and wisdom to grow, wisdom to start growing more and more and more. But it can't unless you do the first part of the work. So it's like trying to build a house on a sand base instead of building a foundation, it just sinks in the mud. It doesn't work, you know? And one of the main complaints that we hear from people when they come to try this practice is, why are you doing it? Because, because I've been practicing for years, many, many different types of things, but in retreats, I make progress at home. It doesn't change anything. Whereas this practice is structured and telling you what it's going to change. And then you have to see if it works. So when you're practicing loving kindness, you can't have any thoughts of ill will arise. And the, this compounds, it's like a compounding system. So when you see it's um, uh, practicing the loving kindness is canceling out ill will when it changes into the karuna and gets softer and not quite as strong, but it's softer and it's very solid and steady. That's karuna. And when the karuna is operating, no thoughts of cruelty can come up. 
And then when that turns into mudita, which is the, the joy a person can experience of success of people around you on a team or of someone else succeeding, you get more happy almost than you ever did for yourself succeeding. When you experience that once, you'll know that what mudita is. It's the only way I can explain that to you. But when you are in the mudita, uh, that's part of what you're doing. No discontent can come up. So they want you to go to the store and get the milk while everybody else is at the, at the house doing something. You're not going to complain. You're fine. Go get the milk. Come back and go back in the house. There's just no objections to things. And so we see people changing in their uh, in the behavioral patterns. It's affecting the behavioral pattern of the person day to day. And we're giving you a practice so tiny, so simple of just remembering that when you feel a tightness in your head, it's time to say, uh, what's the Marathi word? Zaudia, 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 you know, and just say, Zaudia, you know, never mind this, you know, let go, relax, and smile and come back. And this smile, keeping it active, relaxes the, the brain inside. This has all been tested, it's all been verified in science that when you smile and activate this muscle, it runs up to the corner of your eye and into your brain up here and separates these two uh, parts of your brain and lets the pituitary um, start to work correctly. Or the pineal, I'm sorry, pineal gland. I keep saying pituitary, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> but the pineal gland has this endorphins and the dopamine that is released in tiny little pieces and is what uplifts you and makes you just feel happy. So I could say to Sindhu, why are you smiling? Why do you feel happy? And she could sit there in the, in the I don't have any idea. I just feel happy. <laughs> I'm there, okay, that's good. That's good. That, that's a marker. It shows you where you are going. So in those days, uh, you reach wisdom, and when what knowledge is not the same as wisdom, you can have a lot of knowledge, but then you have to have the wisdom whether to activate the knowledge you have or not. That's where mankind has sort of made a few mistakes over the years. <laughs> you know, um, one of the funnier ones I can tell you, there's a lot of really sad ones. They're not funny at all, but this kind of funny is, um, the young, young people will come in to one particular profession. I was in human resources for years and, and this uh, profession has to do with nature and, and conservance of, of uh, natural environments and the eco ecology system. And there was a problem with a particular aphid is a kind of a beetle that eats tomatoes in the tomato crops were suffering in Pennsylvania, New York, and Virginia. So it's always the young ones who do these kind of things without complete research in a hurry to make a mark, to climb to the top of whatever they're doing. And that's what happened here. And so uh, there's a very famous one where someone introduced a vine on the highway. You probably have seen this if you've ever driven on the East Coast of the United States, you've seen pictures of it where the vine was supposed to keep anything from growing on the highway, but the vine took over the trees and killed the trees. And it looked like Edward Scissorhands had a new, uh, he's a guy who cut the trees, particular shapes like elephants and stuff and all kinds of dinosaurs. <laughs> and the thing about it was they introduced this in Virginia, which is now spread to New York and it's all the way to the Midwest as far as the Mississippi River and they can't stop it and nobody can ever kill this vine now that it's been introduced into an ecology system where it didn't belong. And that's what they did to fix the roads and it all backfired. Another one that was kind of the silly one I was thinking of uh, there was a young man who figured out the problem of the aphids and the tomatoes. And he was in his 20s and he got a big prize and a big promotion initially <laughs> for this, but he'll never live it down as long as he lives. Because the thing is, they introduced these little beetles that look this, they're only like this big, you know, just like you see the little right here where my finger is, the size of a ladybug. 
And they are the same appearance as a ladybug, but they're brown and they have dark brownish red, reddish brown uh, dots on them. And when they come out, um, <laughs> The problem was not that they would not that they would survive or not. The problem is what do we do because there's no predator that will eat them. There are no birds that will eat them. There is no snakes that will eat them. Even frogs don't want anything to do with them because they put off it, like some snakes protect themselves by putting off an odor like rotten potatoes. <laughs> and so they put off this odor and nobody wants to eat the, eat, eat the beetle. So now they have all these beetles and you go camping and they're flying in your ears and they're flying in your tent and they're flying in the campgrounds up and down the eastern seaboard and no one can do anything about it. They have no idea what to do. They can't just like gas them or something. They'll kill the birds and they'll kill a lot of other valuable things. So although he did great to think of this and he helped the tomato crops, the problem is <laughs> nobody wants to eat the beetle. So wisdom is a funny thing, <laughs> knowledge and wisdom. So I'm going to throw this open to the floor because the last one I, I really am not, I'm not really all that interested in doing the last one. Um, the last one is kind of long. It's in, I'm not sure I really get it. I read it twice and I'm not really sure. I particularly understand why they wanted this one, but it's, I'll tell you where it is. If you have the Sam Yuchinikai, you can tell me next time what you found. Because you go to page 1351 to page 1356, okay, which is long in itself. And it's a more detailed thing about wealth. And it's basically talking about the ups and downs of wealth, but the wealth is all having to do with supporting each other. And one of the things, it's a very basic thing in Buddhism is why are we here? Where'd we come from? Why are we here? Well, we know why we're here, where we came from, but the point is, why are we here in this lifetime? And the simplest way to put it to you is we're here to help each other, to support each other through this journey in life and well, to help each other. Life. Yeah, to help each other stop uh, suffering in ways that it's just completely wearing us out, you see. And so that's uh, by uplifting each other, by helping each other to learn, to continue educating ourselves and learning. And that's where, that's one of the richest wealths and the happiest thing in the world you can do is learn to be able to watch people uh, to, to teach to him. <laughs> to teach to him is so much fun because watching people come out and wondering, you know, we spend two days, uh, we spend the first day with instructions. We spend the second day with, hindrance management or any kind of blockage you have in your practice explaining what the buddha said expressly not to do and what to do to manage hindrances the third day we teach you about the jhana the jhana levels which we basically call levels of cessation gradual cessation down into the deeper uh, the deeper meditation and if you learn these things in this order specifically they were designed over a period from when Bhatti first figured it out in Thailand back in 1991. And then he starts gradually developing it. So it's kind of a, it, it involves mostly the Majjhima Nikaya. It doesn't go outside the Majjhima Nikaya because the Majjhima Nikaya has the whole teaching in it. And we stick with it to learn the meditation specifically. Later on, you go to the Samyutta Nikaya like we did tonight and you notice they're short. And those short ones very efficiently support the, law, the, the middle length sayings that are in the Majjhima Nikaya, but they're supportive structures. They're not to be, in my opinion, not to be used independently very often for whole lessons because you need other pieces to understand them. You know, that's the only way I can explain it to you. So the, the third day is 
showing you how the levels work of the jhanas, the rupa jhanas and arupa jhanas and how they go down deeper and deeper and deeper. And then the fourth day is, is taking a wonderful time, spending a wonderful time with people for them to discover for the first time that dependent origination uh, can be looked at, the uh, Niroda Samapati can be examined, Paticca Samapati can be examined in three different ways. And the middle way is the most effective way for you to be able to see precisely how suffering is working, in how it arises, exactly the pieces. So I usually teach it like we're, like it's a film, a film school. <laughs> It's, we're teaching you about the film and the film is called My Life. That's what the name of your film is. And the film, it's, it's showing you the pieces step by step that happen that'll get you to fall into the points of suffering. And it shows you precisely where you have an antidote and where you have an escape to use all the time in life. So you have the power to change and learning, just figuring out I'm not helpless. And another one is nothing is happening to me. Everything is actually happening from me. In fact, come to think of it, nothing ever did happen to me. I just wasn't told that, <laughs> okay? And I felt like everything was on top of me, but actually everything was happening from me. And, and taking this and looking at it, and rebalancing it in your mind changes the way you start to look at things. The fact that everything is a process is an amazing discovery because all of a sudden it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. Therefore, I can't go say, oh, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms. <laughs> I can't do that anymore. Nobody is stuck. The last retreat I had, uh, people were sitting there saying, nobody ever said that to me before. How can you say that? I said, I wish people had said that to me when I was growing up. Nobody is stuck. You're only on pause. <laughs> you know, you're only on pause for a minute and you're in the mud, you know, in the mud and the slush. But you have the power to create your own experience in this existence. And that is what all the training is about. And even in this expression, once again, of these seven types of wealth that we're discussing, in those days, a man was measured by what he gave to the community, by the people he helped in his life, by how he shared what he had with the members of his family and the members of the community and the state he lived in. Now it's a race to see who can have the most and somehow, I think sometimes people discover, but a lot of people don't ever discover, they can't take it with them. So they struggle like Scrooge in the Christmas Carol, and they're going to keep it all in a bottle, you know, and I've got it, and this is my wealth, and I count it every night, and I put it over here, and don't anybody look at it, you see, don't do anything with it. So that was the story that this, this first one was about in, um, in this Amnita Nikaya. So that's about all I've got to say about this. What do you guys think about what is the wealth that you need to learn in life? What do you think? I guess Sarah's there. <laughs> you can, you can. Hi. <laughs> So what, what, do you think about, what do you guys think about this one? <laughs> well, we, we didn't hear all of it by any means, but um, uh, it strikes me that wealth is um, our capacity to have a balanced generosity. Mm. Do you, did you hear the one? Did you see it on the board at all or not? No. The seven piece. Okay, let me put it back up so you can just see it for a split second. Oh, actually, I did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's right here, you see? It's like this. There are these seven kinds of wealth to gain in this world. Which seven? Uh, the wealth of faith, the wealth of virtue, the wealth of conscience, the wealth of concern, the wealth of learning, the wealth of generosity, and the wealth of wisdom. 
Well, these are the seven kinds of wealth to develop in this existence, all right? And then it does it again. It says the wealth of faith is one thing and the wealth of virtue. And then the wealth of conscience and concern are sort of two parts in one. And then learning, generosity, and wisdom are the other three that make up the seven. The one who has these wealths, whether a woman or a man, whether they are poor or not poor, I say their life is not deluded. So once again, delusion, we say, is, um, is the idea there is everything is personal. And so the impersonal aspect shows up here by saying their life is not deluded. They are looking at life impersonally as a process. And therefore, it is faith and virtue, confidence and insight into the Dhamma, the intelligent should be devoted to. And these are the very essence of the Buddhist teaching. So that's how we started out in this. I don't know where you came in. <laughs> Quite late, unfortunately. Um, is there a reference for that? I would like to ask you one question. Okay, yeah, okay, Sarma, the go, we go into the Samyutta Nikai, if you want to jot this down, in the Samyutta Nikai, if you've got a copy of it, Bhikkhu Bodhis, what? you go to, uh, the index go to wealth uh, is the topic, and 182 to, to 80, 183, okay, there's a little one that we read in the beginning, and then 315 to 316, there's a story um, on uh, called the Okay. Yeah, Alavaka Sutta. And then 1351 to 56. I didn't go into that when that's in the Gemani Samyutta. And that one is about the, the head, the head person of the clan and does this and that and how it all works with wealth. But we didn't yeah. go into that one so much because well, I'm, I'm familiar with that one. But you say, but there's one on page 1315. 1351. Oh, 13. 50, 1356. Yeah. And the, and the one we didn't, we didn't, I didn't go into that one because it was kind of complicated. And, you know, it's like you need to read it and tell me what you think about it next time. We can talk about that, you know. Let me ask Sarma for a second. Yeah, yeah. Sarah. Okay. Just, Sarma, go ahead. The second uh, aspect, particularly Alavaka, the Alavaka was a king and uh, is ruling uh, Al Alavi is the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And you you said two, three times, get out and recluse uh, all those things occurred. And yeah, finally, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't Finally, like Buddha, Buddha wanted to reform the a demon or a, someone. Uh, Al Alavika is also again a, a demon. He wanted to reform. Yeah. So yeah. all the seven aspects, why can't we say that uh, the Dhamma of an Arahant are a noble person? All the seven aspects are important for the a noble person. So the well, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're for the noble person. Um, they show up a little bit differently in this, but the support that comes out to the same, the same. Group All the seven are, seven that. aspects are required. Yeah. And I should get. I should have the faith on it, and I should practice it. Mm -hmm. This is right. what actually you want to convey from your entire. No, no. Topic. You have to look at. Is it a faith? Is it? <laughs> Faith is required. Yeah, faith is required, but you're saying a faith is required, but faith and a faith are two different things. You got that? Okay, one is a religion, but a person could be an agnostic and still develop faith. You see? He will <laughs> so, be deluded. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it's that way. But when you say, you know, you have to be careful when we say developing faith and we are referring to, you have to have a religion, well, to be stable. Mm -hmm. I remember um, in depressive uh, treatment for depressive disorders, when you're hospitalized, they come to you before you're allowed to go back into mainstream 
and they say to you, you have to fulfill three categories in order for us to say it's okay for you to go out there and try to live again successfully in mainstream, okay? So the first one is you have to have a support tree structure. You have to have a support tree structure. You have to have a place to live, you know, shelter and have that arranged. That's the first one. Second one, you have to have a support tree system where you can go to people or friends or parents or whoever you're going to put in that support tree. You have to have the support tree structure before you can say to the doctor, I'm, I've, I have enough support to go out there and try this. And the third one is interesting because the third one is you have to be in pursuit of a higher power through some form of an organized uh, search. It's interesting. So what, what, what um, when I questioned, uh, when I was in training for advocacy in mental health, and I kept saying, well, why are they saying that? And finally, this doctor said, look, allopathic medicine is, is kind of interesting because it is saying uh, that the person has to be able to say to the doctor, I know what was wrong here and I'm okay here and I'm okay in the physical body, but I also have to be okay in my heart and the pursuit of a higher power as a stabilizing thing. That's the faith he's talking about. So I'm trying to get across to you. That is the faith that you are trying to, to, uh, feel that you 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 have you're developing that faith in yourself and in buddhism a large amount of that faith is developed through knowledge and wisdom of how things actually work that is our stability thing we go to another place it might be that ganesh is giving me all the answers <laughs> Ganesh gives me a lot of answers, but <laughs> I like Ganesh because I've told you this guy, guys a lot of time for the disabled community gives a lot of people are faithful to Ganesh, you know, you're missing an arm, you're missing a leg, you're missing something, but you don't have an elephant head on your body to carry around. And Ganesh, you, there's no way to cut it. You don't see this about the story, but I see it just by looking at the statue. If, it, if he could get through anything and grow up with that kind of a disability. And I've seen people in Malaysia, I may have told you the man who had his hand uh, at the wrist born with the attachment here to the back of his head. So that his hand was over here. Can you see my hand? And he could pick up a bag of potatoes or a big sack of rice and carry it home but he would not have this removed from the back of his head and his neck under any circumstances. He was born that way and he would leave it that way. And I've met children with six or eight toes and not eight, but six potless, see, potless, six and seven toes. And one person was fascinating with, um, you know, I met someone with a extra finger, extra baby finger, but it was functional, fully and completely functional. He was a friend of mine. He's a medical doctor. And he said, I'll be darned if they're going to take that away because I've been using it my whole entire life. I was born that way. And nobody was going to take that away. So he's trying to figure out his whole life why that was a wonderful extra thing. And you wouldn't even know it was there, but he would hold his hand kind of like this, you know, when he's talking to you. But when you're sitting at a desk with him, he can do a lot of extra things with this little finger and this finger working the two simultaneously. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a gift and everybody thought it was a curse and it turned out to be a fine gift, you see? So this thing about faith, I think that's what I was trying to, I don't know All if I got it Knowledge, knowledge and wisdom. That is only Dhamma practice. Yeah. With Dhamma practice only you can achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got any more for me? Yeah. That's nothing else. Okay. That was good. Sarah? Yeah. Hi. I um I had an observation about the the seven, first of all which is some of them uh, appear to be aspects that we can practice towards, obviously the generosity or like, like you've been describing that the, the faith and the, and the virtue, but some of them seems to seem that they are, um, they're what happens through the practice. So confidence, you can't kind of get confidence. There isn't a practice to be confident. That Is seems that to be something that, that arrives through through some of the um, 
through through the way that you're learning to listen and what you're what you're seeing no it wasn't it wasn't confidence it was conscience and concern. oh okay yeah oh, okay i think there so was develop, confidence in there no conscience. it was faith and virtue okay. and then uh conscience and concern so we when okay. if you weren't here i've seen conscience and concern something's happened in our life where we are really bothers our conscience and one thing was letter writing during um, the Vietnam conflict and the nuclear um, race between the USSR and the United States was so devastating for young people. And the way that we um, relieve our conscience is many parents were very tied up in knots, what to say to their children, what to talk to their children about, and all of these things. And I got involved in a movement about stress in children living in the nuclear age. And this was a, a hot topic in about 1985, 86, and 87, before SALT Treaty was signed and stuff, okay? And um, for the dismantling of the weaponry, okay? So your conscience is bothered. And one of the things we did at that time was we did letter writing. And so letter writing, at least this was something where mom and dad and the kids, we sit down once a week and we wrote letters to our senators and told them why we thought they shouldn't be talk, number one, talking about these things as if they're bows and arrows and they're perfectly harmless. And they shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be a big race that's going on like this. I mean, imagine yourself a little kid and you go in the store and your mommy is shopping for food and you, uh, the magazine racks at that particular time, they were by the cash register, right by the cash registers. And then they passed a law. They had to be in a corner of the store. They could not be at the front of the store anymore. And the reason that happened, why they all went to the, to the corner of the store in the back was because then children were not so apt to get sick of their stomachs seeing a picture of a globe with a guy gas masks poking out of the front of the earth and missiles sticking out of their eyes and nose and mouth and everything. And this was Time Magazine covers in 1985, 86 and 87 were ridiculous. We didn't want our children to even see them or be exposed to them. They were so upsetting. And they turn on the news at night at six o'clock and hear that you know, your child comes to you in the kitchen while you're washing the dishes and he says to you, mommy, it's terrible. We don't have enough missiles. And I said, what do you mean we don't have enough missiles? Well, they just announced that the Russians have 28,000 warheads and we only have 21,000. And, you know, you, mommy's standing there, if she has any knowledge at all, knowing that if six of them go off at one time, we're the whole Northern Hemisphere is over, you know. <laughs> so they're actually playing with uh, toys that they cannot use, they cannot eat, and they cannot ride. They can compete building these things. And then look what happened with salt. And all these things are in your conscience and why people are, don't understand. Sitting in letter writing is no mean thing because if you're in Rhode Island and you and I write a letter, it's only counting for 300 letters, 300 voting opinions. But if I go to Virginia, it's up to 4,000. If I go to the West Coast, it could be 11 or 12 or 14,000 in some of the populated states like Texas and California and New York and other uh, Florida places like that. When you write a letter, it, you're actually writing the letter and framing it the way you want to say what's wrong, why we don't want this to be there anymore. And you're telling those people in office, and we're not voting for you again unless you straighten this out. You see, so it was the constituency speaking out for the first time during that period of about three to four years. And it was based on research from 75 to 1985 that the whole movement for uh, something has to be done from the parents position for the children that it happened because uh, it just uh, <laughs> happened because of the missiles that they put in the cornfields across the United States and up near Canada, Canadian border, aiming them at Russia over the poles. That's what it was all about. That's what tripped everything off. The whole movement began from two little kids that went to some pediatricians, the young pediatricians. I don't think the older pediatricians would have caught it, but these young pediatricians, when you take your kids in at about, um, I think it's like, it's about four years old and you ask them, 
draw a picture of your house and your parents and life. And, um, you know, <laughs> these kids are asked basic questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's a simple question, isn't it? It's the first time you, your pediatrician is the first person, even before kindergarten, who asked your child that question in the United States and the West. And the kids were saying, if I grow up, I want to be. Do you hear the problem? Did you hear what my question was? Let me do it again. When I, when you, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's a question. And the kids said, if I grow up, I want to be. And they caught this, and that is what tripped off the research in about five major books and brought it to the attention of the American Psychological Association. Be, the, because they did the research from 75 to 85 and 85, 86 and 87, American Psychological Association uh, were, were really paying attention to this whole thing. And then these organizations, the parents set up in Washington and in Ottawa, in Canada and in, in UK had one and parts of Europe had them also, that brought the whole thing to kind of a head parents can do something. They have to be able to say something, do something. They can't just stand there and say, oh, don't be silly. Nobody's going to push the button, go play outside. Because the kids go to school and they talk and they talk about what they heard on the news and they talk about what they saw in the store. And that was the problem. And there were kids that uh, went, where did this all go? I mean, this whole thing moved into five-year programs in college instead of four years because they started allowing them to change majors more often and stay longer. And many quitting school and committing suicide and all kinds of stuff. Can you help? I, the water is coming. <laughs> the major problem with Sister Kama. <laughs> Yeah, so in a roundabout way, that, that is um, what happened with that whole story. The water's always coming here. It's a delightful thing. I'm really glad it's coming. <laughs> I just wish it could figure out how to have a class without the water coming. <laughs> um, so anybody else have any questions on this? Hmm? We done? Yeah? I guess so. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so certain things will be happening this month because I'll be dedicating this month to taking care of um, medical issues and stuff. And um, I'm, but I'm pretty sure I can pull off Wednesdays and Sunday nights okay. And uh, there'll be somebody filling in if I don't. Okay but it'll only be for this month. And then things should clear up because in March and April, we have new things scheduled. And so everything keeps going on. Okay. Okay. So everybody smile. <laughs> All right. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, sounds good. See you next week. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Have a good week. Keep smiling. Don't let anything get you down. You know, just remember that new word I taught you, Zaudia. <laughs> and let it all go. Never mind. Let go. Relax. Smile. Come back. We need we need some music for that. If anybody can think about that, let go. 
let go, relax, smile, come back here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, see you next week. Bye-bye.